Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're coming to you live from the Delta Country Exhibit at the Tennessee Aquarium. So glad to have you joining us today. We thought we'd take this opportunity to talk about the birds here at the aquarium, and you're looking at Minnow, who is a fish crow. And Minnow is a, a really character. She's been a little talkative here this morning. Uh, she does live here in the Delta Country Exhibit. So Amanda Reeves, one of our bird experts, is going to uh, take an opportunity to talk about Minnow just a little bit and actually give her an opportunity to just take off and fly around here. Yeah, so Minnow is a fish crow, like Tom said, and these birds are a little bit different than your American crow, which you're probably used to seeing around in your backyard. The main difference is going to be their size. The fish crow is just a little bit smaller than the American crow, and they have a little bit different call. A fish crow is going to sound like they're talking out of their nostrils a little bit more than the very common American sound, which is just the caw, caw. These guys definitely sound like they're talking from their nostrils. But like you said, she can come out. She lives in this exhibit. Usually I'll call her down if I want to do a presentation or something like that with her. And today she's choosing to sit in there for the moment. <laughs> but maybe while we're hanging out, yeah. she'll decide to come out and fly around. A Crows bit. are super smart birds. I had the opportunity to be behind the scenes with you and Minnow a couple of days ago. And she's very sweet. You have a very uh, good relationship with her. Again, we're so glad to have everybody flocking together with us online during this time of social distancing. And we know we've got a lot of folks at home, so we appreciate you connecting with us online uh, during this special time to learn a little bit more about these cool animals. And the Delta, Amanda, is a really cool place because um, there's a lot of room in here for the birds to fly around and I'm sure Minnow just really loves this space. She does and if you guys ever happen to be walking through our Delta and you happen to hear someone say good girl from a tree it's very likely it's this crow. So <laughs> crows are able to mimic human sounds and voices so if you do hear any unique sounds when you're in here it's likely her because she does like to fly around and do a lot of her vocalizations. Is that there. true of American crows too, or just the fish crows that they can mimic? So all corvids, so that's gonna be your crows, your ravens, your blue jays, they can all mimic that. So there is a good chance, I mean, if you had a lot of patience while everyone's sitting at home, you could go sit outside every single day and just keep saying hi repeatedly and maybe throwing out some food for some of the native crows and maybe they'll pick something up. All right, I must take just a couple of steps back and see if Minnow will come out because I know you've got some, there we go. <laughs> uh, see if Minnow will come out and get some of the treats that you have. And I will encourage everybody who's watching right now to uh, post your uh, questions in the comment section here. And um, we'll have some fun here with uh, not only Minnow, but we also have another resident of the Delta uh, country area. And our barred owl Bubba will be making an appearance here just a little bit. So if you got some questions about birds, Amanda is here. We also have with us uh, Kevin Calhoun, who's going to be telling us a little bit more about birding because this is one of the cool things that you can do at home right now. And it's a great time to be birding. Doesn't matter whether you live in a rural area or an urban setting. Birds are all around. They're starting to color up for their breeding season, which is coming up in the spring. And we're also very fortunate for birding opportunities right now because the leaves aren't out on the trees right now. So you can see the birds a lot better. Uh, even if you're on your front porch or your, or your back porch or just driving around in your car, keep your eyes peeled because it's a great time to do some birding. And Minnow is just comfortable sitting right there and she's not being tempted by the treats. What did you bring her for a treat? And what do crows here at the aquarium eat? So right now I have dog food and some mealworms for her. So that doesn't I've... sound like a very good meal. <laughs> she loves it. Those are some of her favorite things to eat. So she's gonna usually get a dog food every day. She's also eating fruits and vegetables. Like today she had peas and blackberries for breakfast. And then she'll also get some another type of protein. So today she's getting a mouse. The other day she had some quail chicks or it might be some lake smelt, which is a type of fish or some trout as well. She also enjoys getting crayfish because then she gets to kind of crack and break those open to get inside. 
side to them. But this is kind of a good example of training. Like you said, she's really comfortable in her kennel. So just like a lot of you, if you have a dog at home or something, you want their kennel to be a really safe place for them. Something you want them to be, feel comfortable going into. And so getting her to come down to kind of go in different places in the aquarium, this is what we use as her kennel. So as you can see, she is very comfortable in there, even though this is her whole exhibit out here to be. All right, well, we'll let her uh, just kind of sit in there for a little bit, uh, and maybe we can get Bubba out so everybody can see Bubba. Looks like Minnow is just very comfortable being where she is, and that's okay. And uh, she's got some treats right here on the top of that pole, so we'll see um, if she'll go and get one of those treats. Good question from Sarah Sweat. And Amanda, how old is Minnow? So Minnow uh, will actually be five years old in May. And what is the average life expectancy for crows? And so this is one of a, the crowd favorites, Bubba. Uh, when he makes appearances during our special presentations, um, people just love to get up close. And this is really cool because this is a bird that could be in a lot of our viewers' backyards. Yeah, the barred owl is really common around here, really pretty much all over the United States. You used to not be able to find them out west, but they've actually been moving out that way a little bit and kind of pushing out the spotted owl, actually. So pretty much no matter where you're tuning in from, you may see these guys or you're more likely to hear them before you're going to see them. So this owl is sometimes referred to as the hoot owl and that's because they have several variations of hoots that they can do. But one of the most common ones that they'll do is the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. I don't know, Kevin, can you do a good oh, yeah. impersonation of that? You did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a really long call and you've probably actually been hearing that quite a bit the last few months if you do have some barred owls residing in your area because it has been barred owl breeding season. So they would have been looking for a mate and they would have been out there being really vocal. Now this owl is a true night owl though, so they are going to be most active when it's really dark out. So most of the time the pair that's in my backyard I'll hear about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So. Sometimes it can wake you up, but it's still a really cool sound to get to hear. We love the fact that we have parents watching with their children, and we have a great question from Micah, who asks, how long are minnows' wings? And we'll answer a question that will probably come up, how long are Bubba's wings at the same time? So minnows are about two feet long, and then Bubba's here are about three and a half to four feet. So Bubba definitely has a lot bigger wingspan than what minnow does. Outstanding. And people always um, ask, how much does an owl like that weigh? Because they look like they're pretty heavy birds. Yeah, Bubba here is just over a pound. So that is all that he weighs. And Minnow actually only weighs a half pound. So you gotta remember that birds have to defy gravity. So they have to be able to fly. So the majority of Bubba here is nothing but feathers. And birds also have hollow bones to make it really easy for them to fly. <laughs> And of course, they don't have any teeth. So it's really funny as Minnow is calling back there and I feel like she's a little bit jealous <laughs> that you're paying so much attention to Bubba and not her. What's going on there? That is very possible. There's a lot of times that if I'm doing stuff with Bubba, Minnow will actually come sit on my shoulder because she's so curious and she wants to try to get all the attention. Okay. Owls have all kinds of interesting and really cool adaptations. Can you talk about their eyes and their neck and their beak? Yeah, so owl eyes, you may notice, are very large no matter what the species is. And that's because owl eyes are so large, there's actually no room inside their head for muscles for them to be able to move their eyes. So their owls are, eyes are actually fixed or stuck in one spot. So like, if we get mad at our mom and we want to roll our eyes, owls cannot do that. So they have to be able to move their head to see what's going on. So owls actually have more vertebrae or bones in their neck compared to us. Us and even giraffes actually only have seven, where owls have 14. So it gives them the ability, as you can see, Bub is turning his head all around looking everywhere. And that's so he can see, because that's the only way he can see what's going on, is by being able to move his head like that. And there goes Minnow. <laughs> Minnow was about to land. That's okay. Minnow was about to land on Kevin's head, which was really pretty funny. And she's way up in the treetops now. If we can, yeah, oh, she's she right over here. Look, you. we'll take a look here and see. There's Minnow, <laughs> right up there in the treetops. Hello, Minnow. 
Now she's probably waiting because she thinks Amanda's got those treats for her still. Otherwise she'd go way up in the treetops, but Minnow's pretty happy to be right overhead right now. We'll see if she comes back to Amanda in a minute. Hey, we've had a couple of great questions from some kids. One, what do owls eat? So owls can eat a big variety. A barred owl specifically is going to enjoy eating a lot of amphibians. So they like to go after those salamanders or lizards. They'll also eat small mammals as well. But one really interesting thing I find about barred owls is they actually enjoy eating crayfish. So if they live in an area where crayfish is pretty popular, you may actually see them wading in a creek trying to get that crayfish. And one way you can tell if an owl has a pretty heavy diet in crayfish is see on Bubba where he's got these little bit lighter colored feathers. Those will actually start to get take on a little bit of a pink hue if they've actually ate quite a bit of crayfish. Beautiful bird. Uh, another question from uh, some of the children that are watching. How old can barred owls live? So if an owl lives past its first year of life, then there is a good chance that they can make it into their late teens. Um, with owls, some of their main predators are unfortunately cars because a bird when they're flying kind of want to dip down to the lowest point to conserve some energy. And like I said, the only way they're really looking around them is moving that head. So unfortunately, sometimes cars. That's why you might see these guys on the side of the road quite a bit. Owls are just such cool birds and it's such a pleasure to be able to have this opportunity to show everybody Bubba the barred owl. That's barred, B-A-R-R-E-D owl. And one of the cool things that you can do is go to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website and they have all kinds of bird calls. And they also have the Merlin app that you can download so you can listen to bird calls and identify the birds that are in your backyard. And our other bird expert, Amanda and Bubba, thank you. We're gonna turn over here to Kevin Calhoun. Uh, Kevin, um, this is a really cool place for birds because people yeah. can see a variety of birds yeah. in this space. So tell us about the birds that are... Well, this is the Delta exhibit, and the most obvious birds in here are, we have two female hooded mergansers. They're kind of a brown bird with a long, straight beak. We have a male and a female wood duck. So the hooded mergansers are interesting because they are in our area most of the winter time. They don't breed here. They breed up in Ohio and north of Ohio. Um, but if you go out to the lake or river or a pond, you might see a hooded merganser. The wood ducks are a bird that we're familiar with. The males are very colorful, very beautiful. The females a little duller because they spend time on, the, on their eggs. But that's a, even though these birds, I have a northern cardinal in here, I have a yellow, uh, yellow rumped warbler. Yeah, the cardinal, the females right, right up here, right, right up in this close. area, right in here. And even though this is an exhibit that shows off the birds of the Mississippi Delta, Louisiana, these are all species that can be found in our area in southeast Tennessee. So. The Northern Cardinal is a good example. Like Tom was talking about, this is a good time just to watch the birds in your own yard at home. If you have a bird feeder, um, it will attract Northern Cardinals. We're all familiar with them. And that's a bird that we call a year-round resident. They're a permanent resident to Tennessee, so we'll see them all year round. The hooded merganser is what we call a winter resident, so they're only here during the winter time. So March is a special time because we have a mixture of winter birds who've been wintering here. Birds like the dark-eyed junco and the um, white-toed sparrow and a ruby crown kinglet. Those are birds that winter here. And then we have birds that are starting to migrate up from the from the south. So a purple martin's a good example. It's a swallow that came in from uh, Mexico and Central America. And they came in in the middle of February. So that's a bird that oh, spends winter months down in the tropics. So we call those neotropical migrants. So you can kind of see the hooded bergandas kind of went around the bend. They're kind of shy. Um, but we also have a yellow rumped warbler in here, which I don't see right now. But at your house, I mean, water is really important. If you can keep a fresh um, supply of water, you'll see birds. If you can keep a supply of water that has water running or moving or making sounds, that attracts birds too. So the bird feeders are very important. But also, this time of year, you can put your hummingbird feeders up soon because the hummingbirds will be coming back probably the last week in March, first week in April. So we look forward to seeing them. And that's a bird that is very interesting because they're such a small species, but they winter as far south as Ecuador. And then they migrate back here for the spring and summer. Uh, suet feeders are really are. Uh, inexpensive to put up, and yeah. they attract such a wide variety of birds. Tell me about the types of birds that are attracted to suet, yeah, suet feeders. Suet is more the insect-eating birds, so northern mockingbirds will come. Sometimes rose-breasted grosbeaks or, or different types of tanagers. Things that don't necessarily eat seed will come and eat suet. Pine warblers, which is a really colorful yellow bird that lives in your backyard. 
will come to Suet. And Suet's cheap. You can buy a block at Walmart or a discount store or something and just put it up. The one problem is, is Amanda's crows sometimes will take the suet away. They'll actually, I've had them take the whole suet and fly off with it, which is okay. We're feeding them too. <laughs> yeah. So, but suet makes your yard a little bit more interesting. I know at my house, um, I have about four different species of woodpeckers right. that come up to the suet blocks. Yes, woodpeckers and love suet. Especially right now, <laughs> yeah. it's very nice. We're going to walk over here, Kevin, okay. because Minnow came back down to, to get her treat. Okay. And she's just, you know, enjoying her treat right there with Amanda and Bubba. But, um, it's, it's so nice to, you know, have those birds in your yard yes. and be able to enjoy it. And it really does give you a, a stress break. And if you're someone who enjoys photography, having birds in your yard, it's just one of those things that you can, you don't have to go far. You can go right on your front porch and take a little a mental break and, and just enjoy nature and, and the sound of birds. And what's nice about right. having a bird app or being around a bird expert like Kevin is you may not see the birds, but you'll know that you've got a certain number of species just right. by the sound. So tell us how you identify birds by sound. Well, you know, it takes a lot of practice. But I do a lot of bird survey work, and a lot of that survey work is purely listening to birds. Sometimes we don't even look at the birds. We just listen for them. So this time of year, the birds, like the barred owl, are starting to call a lot more now. They're getting ready for spring. The photo period's getting longer. So a lot of the birds are... There, a lot of birds sing all year round, but they have special songs they sing in the spring. So we're starting to hear... The Carolina chickadee, the tufted tent mouse, have a whole different song they're starting to sing now than they did all winter time. So there's a lot of evidence of spring. Like I said, spring started for a lot of birds in the middle of February. So, but the barred owls right now are actually on their nests still. They, they nest inside of cavities and trees and so on. Great horned owls are nesting still. Eastern screech owls. So we have three species of owls that you can see in your backyard. Um, if you have a, you can get boxes. You can actually get a box for a barred owl because they are a cavity nest. So they have a big hole for a barred owl. But you can get a box for a um, street eastern screech owl. And of course, eastern bluebirds right now have already picked out their boxes. They're probably starting to build their nests already. So there's things you can do at home by putting boxes up and so on um, that will help so you can watch the breeding in your own backyard. How about hawks in our area? Yes. Because um, I had a couple of red-shouldered hawks that were uh, very visible during the winter months, but right now it seems like they're not around. So are they nesting? Is that they why? They are nesting. They get, they get a little quieter when they nest. They're, they're kind of the um, hawk equivalent of a barred owl because they eat kind of the same things. They eat a lot of crawfish, they eat a lot of snakes and frogs and so on. They like to nest along streams and right, what we call riparian areas. That's vegetation along water. And they're very, actually very loud hawk, just kind of like the barred owl is quite a loud owl. But they're starting to settle down because they're starting to nest soon also. We also have the red-tailed hawk is the one you might see chasing your squirrels in your backyard. And you also might see the cooper's hawk, which is a, is a purely a bird-eating hawk that you'll see. Sometimes they'll come and nab the chickadee off your feeder, which is okay because those hawks have to feed too. Yeah. So the question is, um, the pre-mixed hummingbird, the, which is red-colored, or should you just mix your own with sugar water? That's the big I question. Sugar water. I, use a, I just use a, a quarter sugar to four times water boil it so it makes sure that it melts down and that's what I use. You don't need an artificial color. Most of the hummingbird feeders actually have some red on them already and another nice thing is to plant some petunias or some flowers around your feeder that will attract them also. So there's no point buying anything that has that red dye in it. So I just use one part sugar, four parts water and boil it and mix it that way. Outstanding. Well, we're going to wrap things up here from the Delta Country. Thanks Kevin. Thanks Amanda. Thank Thanks, Bubba and Minnow, the fish crow, for uh, being with us today on this Facebook Live event. We'll continue to have more of these as time goes on. We invite you to join us and stay tuned. Most of those we'll schedule for about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We're uh, working on a schedule for you that will try to give you as much advance notice as well. So stay connected to our Facebook page while we're apart. We can't wait to have this situation pass so we can invite you back to the Tennessee Aquarium and really welcome everyone back in a big way. I would also let you know that um, it is uh, difficult for a nonprofit organization like the Tennessee Aquarium right now uh, without having guests in the building. So on our home page of our website, there is a Donate Now button for our Emergency Operations Fund, which helps support um, caring for the animals during this very uh, challenging time. So if you have an opportunity and you can go there, great. If not, please stay connected with us. And we've got a lot of resources on our website at Aquarium at Home. It's right on our homepage and you can uh, find all kinds of activity sheets, educational materials, and that is also a page that we will continue to update in the days ahead. 
Thanks again, everybody, for watching today, and we will see you soon on Facebook Live.